Hello, hello, welcome to another episode of Prehistory in the Dark. I am your host, Darkness the Curse. And before we begin, as always, thank you so much to my generous patrons and our channel members from our sister channel over at History in the Dark. You are the reason why this content remains well preserved. And today, we get to talk about probably one of the, if not the, maybe not the, depends how you look at it, best preserved fossils ever found of anything. There are probably a few examples that are technically better preserved, but this one set the paleontological community on fire when it was discovered. This is the story of the Suncor Notosaur. Boreolopelta mark Micheli is a species of dinosaur that is, well, naturally extinct. It is a notosaurid ankylosaur. An ankylosaur is a pretty famous type of dinosaur, mostly due to their status as walking tanks. They were one of the most heavily armored dinosaurs that ever lived, and they were actually quite prevalent. There are many, many different species of these creatures that have been discovered over the years, but the one we're gonna focus on today is Boreolopelta. And under Boreolopelta, there is only the Mark Michele species, which was first named in 2017 by Caleb Brown and colleagues from the well-preserved holotype specimen. You may have seen it, as it actually made international news when it was first unveiled. The specimen is so pristine. It's an incredible find. And it was first uncovered on March 21st, 2011 at the Millennium Mine, which is an oil sands mine. It's about 30 kilometers, 19 miles, north of Fort McMurray, Alberta in Canada. It's owned and operated by Suncor Energy, which were, of course, at the time, mining for oil sands which are loose sands or partially consolidated sandstone that contain a naturally occurring mixture of sand, clay, and water that's soaked with bitumen, a dense and extremely viscous form of petroleum. They were mining for fossil fuels, and though they likely found a lot of fossil fuel, they also found, well, a fossil. It was discovered by miner Sean Funk, who was digging in a bag at the time and noticed the specimen. Instead of continuing to dig and possibly destroy it, he contacted a supervisor who realized immediately that this was something that needed to be reported, like now. They alerted the Royal Tyrell Museum of Paleontology, and in accordance with their own mining permit, as well as Alberta's fossil laws, the specimen actually became property of the Alberta government. They couldn't actually dig past it at all, even if they wanted to, legally. Though they could have just not reported it, but they did, so they did the right thing in this case. On March 23rd, Royal Tyrell Museum scientists Donald Henderson and a senior technician named Darren Tank were brought to the mine to look the specimen over. Now, this area isn't unknown to having fossils, but in the past, it was actually submerged in a prehistoric sea. And based on the photographs they'd already looked at, they were expecting it to be some kind of marine reptile, possibly a plesiosaur. No land animals had ever been discovered in the area previously. But when they looked at it, they realized it was not that at all. This was a dinosaur, a very, very well-preserved dinosaur. The animal must have been washed out to sea at some point. And the running theory is that she must have drowned, since the chylosaurs were, of course, very heavy, and probably not very good at swimming. The museum staff, as well as the Suncor employees, worked together to extract the fossil safely. The employees, in particular, had three days of safety training to make sure they knew exactly how to get this thing out with minimal damage. Fossils are extremely delicate. Extracting them requires very, very specific technique, and above all, patience. They set aside the pieces that had already broken free as a result of finding it in the first place, and the bulk of the specimen was actually still embedded 8 meters, 26 feet, up a cliff. So not only did it have to be extremely careful, it was also positioned in like the most annoying place imaginable. The process actually took two weeks in total, and it did not go perfectly. A major piece of rock that contained a significant bulk of it actually broke under its own weight when it was being lifted out. The museum staff did not respond well to that, but it wasn't exactly anyone's fault, it was just one of those things, and they salvaged the specimen by wrapping and stabilizing the pieces in plaster, after which they were able to transport them back to the Royal Tyrell Museum. That was when Mark Mitchell took over. He was a technician, 
and he spent six years removing the adhering rock and preparing the fossil for actual study. The entire process, due to how groundbreaking this fossil find was, was actually sponsored by the National Geographic Society. But six years? And yeah, that's not unusual. Like I said, fossils are very delicate, and when it comes to removing excess rock around them, you can't just exactly whack them with a hammer, so you have to be very meticulous at this and extremely careful with what you're doing. Mitchell, however, did a phenomenal job, and that's why when they realized that this was a new species of ankylosaur, it was named after him. Boreolopepta, Mark Mitchelly. And good for him, I say. I would love a dinosaur named after me one day. The specimen was finally put on public exhibit on March 12th, 2017, and it set the world on fire due to how well preserved it was. But let's talk about what we know about this particular species based on these remains. The holotype shows that the Borealopelta was a large dinosaur that measured about 5.5 meters or 18 feet long and weighed about 1.3 metric tons. Now, by dinosaur standards, it's not exactly the largest thing in the world, but it wasn't exactly small either. Very middle of the road for dinosaurs, but still ankylosaur, walking tank, you know. The specimen is believed to have sunk upside down into the sea shortly after it died, which caused the top half of the body to be quickly buried with minimal distortion. The result is that the specimen preserves the animal almost as it would have looked like in life. Fossilization is actually a lot vaguer of a term than you'd think. There are many, many different methods for this sort of thing, and the best in terms of actual perfect preservation is probably up there involving amber. But amber can only get small creatures, like insects, for example, which is usually what we find. And although other dinosaur specimens have been discovered with some partial mummification that happened prior to fossilization, very few things to this extent have ever been found, especially involving a creature that was so large. The remains answered a lot of questions regarding how the plates on ankylosaurs generally fell, at least when it came to this specific species. They were even able to analyze the stomach contents to figure out the diet, and it was discovered that they were very picky. Almost the entirety of the contents were, well, ferns, and 6% of it actually contained charcoal, which led to the idea that the animal had been feeding in an area that was experiencing regrowth after a recent wildfire. These are the sorts of questions that paleontology loves getting the answers to, and having such a pristine specimen to examine gives us an incredible window into the past. But why this animal specifically? Why was it so well preserved? Like I said, fossilization is very vague in terms of terminology. There are many different methods, and I could do a whole video about the different methods of fossilization. But what happened with this one? Why is it so pristine? Well, this animal would have lived during the early Cretaceous period, during the Albion Age, about 110 to 112 million years ago. The region back then was covered by the Western Interior Seaway, which stretched from the Arctic Ocean to the Gulf of Mexico. It's believed that this specimen must have washed out to sea, maybe during a flood of some kind, or simply fell into a raging river. Either way, however it happened, the poor animal drowned and sunk back first to the bottom. And Calosaurians are rather front-heavy, and top-heavy for that matter, so it makes sense as to why it would have flipped over this way. When it landed in the seabed, it hit with enough force to actually deform the immediately underlying sediments. About 15 centimeters, 5.9 inches of sediment settled over the remains prior to the release of body fluids, as evidenced by fluid escape structures that were preserved in the sediments, and the body cavity itself became filled with sand. Then a concretion of siderite began to form around the carcass shortly after it landed on the seabed. Siderite is a mineral that's composed of iron carbonate, and the concretion, just so we're clear, is a hard compact mass formed by the precipitation of mineral cement within the spaces between particles. It's generally found in sedimentary rock or soil. The point is this animal was effectively encased within the siderite, which prevented scavengers from eating away at it over time and preserved the body intact with its scales and osteoderms in their original configuration, preserved for millions of years, only for us to unearth it and get an amazing look at this animal. The specimen has not only answered a ton of questions about her own species, beyond just revealing that she was her own species, 
but also answered other questions regarding other ankylosaurs. For a long time, it wasn't clear exactly how the plates fell on ankylosaurs' backs. We knew they had them, we knew they were armored dinosaurs, but in terms of exactly how they were placed, it wasn't 100% confirmed, but with this animal, we could see how other related species may have also had their plates laid out. And actually looking at it, if you look at the ankylosaurs in Jurassic Park, you can see that when it came to these animals in general, we actually weren't that far off in terms of what we thought, but still, there's always more to learn, and more importantly, confirm. That's the thing about paleontology in general. Unlike so many other fields of science, it's chock full of theories. Things that we think, things that we believe. Because from a scientific perspective, there's only so many ways we can test and confirm the theories. Because all we have are these remains. But when remains like this come along, that are so well preserved, that they can answer a bunch of questions just on their own, then that's a win for the scientific community. And the specimen will likely remain on display for years to come as paleontologists continue to debate and use the remains to enhance our knowledge of the past. Till next time, this is Darkness, and I bid you all a fond farewell.